Another uh, artist is someone by the name of um, André Dirin, and uh, he, it, it may have been he who said that you, you can't really exist uh, in a state of paroxysm forever and ever. No, I think it was Brock actually, uh, Picasso's partner. And even Gaga, if he looked at something like this, would be taken aback. These are very, very intense, um, intense colors. Um, and, and again, he does this with these un unmodulated, uh, complementary colors, rather than mixing the colors. And as such, we see, uh, uh, we see the, uh, the green and the blue, we see the orange and the yellow, uh, and, and there are shades uh, in between. There are some people walking around this pit that looks like uh, some sort of a pit. There's a horseman, just uh, barely sketched. But it's all about the movement of colors, and it's all about the um, the uh, the application of color. There's there's a lot of of course uh, Gaga, some of Van Gogh as well. I mean, again, these little choppy 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 colors. Um, but when you see, for instance, uh, the two of uh, here's Pissarro uh, that he painted in uh, twenty years earlier. This is this was painted twenty years before this, and. Um, and Pissarro, of course, is uh, the ultimate Impressionist. And interestingly enough, um, Impressionism seems, seemed full of color. Uh, but, compared, but compared to the Fauve, it almost looks dark. Whereas, of course, if you're in a museum and if you are in a room with the realist painters, there'll be earth colors, there'll be the browns and the grays and, uh, and the dark colors. And then if you go from that room into the next where the Impressionists are, I mean, you'll, you'll be surrounded by color and, and, and joy. And well, that's what Impressionists were. Um, but, uh, but to these people, Impressionists now seemed a little dull. And one of them said so. So they wanted sort of to, to turn the knob uh, up to make it a lot warmer, a lot hotter, in fact. Well, this is still kind of realistic. I mean, Impressionists very much held on to visual reality. It's just that they saw it in their own way and they dissolved the actual form. But it was still visual reality. They, they, that's what they painted. They did not paint their, their inside, uh, to, their, their tortured souls or their happy souls. Or they, they, just ha they, they painted what they saw. I mean, today we look at it and it's just a beautiful, colorful, decorative picture. I mean, anybody would love to have it on one's wall, independently of, uh, of price, I mean, even the print. Um, but back then, it, uh, it was a shock. It was, it was very, very seriously a shock. He also, of course, came to, um, came to the south of France with Matisse. And when you see the two of them, the same choppy brushwork, a little thicker that, that Matisse is using, but basically the same idea, the, the desire to show, to convey the feeling of the, of the Mediterranean and its bristling light, its bristling colors, its, um, its bristling mood, really. That's what, what these, are, these are about. And then he goes north, he, he did, he visited London, and, uh, well, as I said before, color does not uh, travel easily to the north, even now Dirac does, um, does his best. So his colors are still intense, but they're dark intense instead of very light intense. And that's what he does here. So London is not, is not, is not Saint-Tropez, so it's not uh, the south of France. And as a result, from this to this is, uh, is a large difference, of course. Uh, ah. Here, here are our bathers. He also produces the bathers, just as everybody, again, loves to produce the bathers. It's kind of its own joie de vivre of sorts, with the nudes. And again, this, this, this natural belonging to, uh, to the rivers, to the forests, to the primordial joy uh, before the fall. All of this is very attractive. Uh, and you remember, you remember our uh, bathers by Cezanne, but Cezanne, in fact, still sort of introduces, he, he does, in fact, introduce a rather realistic space uh, perspective uh, with his bathers and builds, gives us a structure to follow. 
sort of the structure of the Gothic cathedral, whereas uh, Diran will not even um, do that. And, but you can see, I mean, this is uh, cubism is happening as we speak, and that will be the the part of our uh, next lecture. And this, of course, is part of that. Diran, I mean, he obviously, uh, of course, knew about Cezanne's bathers. Uh, he also already knows about. Picasso's work, and uh, and in fact he sort of emulates both of them. Another one was uh, Raoul uh, Dufy, and uh, he kind of found his métier. He he found his niche in street festivals uh, uh, in, in France, uh, in England too. I think when all the banners are out, and all the banners, of course, are very colorful and um, and very distinct. And uh, so this is a very typical painting of. Uh, uh, of Dufy, uh, there are many others that also just exhibit a lot of flags of, uh, of great colors. Uh, and here we come to this very strange um, uh, man. He was a devout Catholic and he did not possess a happy soul at all. Uh, he just felt very much that the world is utterly against him and uh, well in, in the series of these paintings, he took it out on, on the women. <laughs> Incarnation of evil, this uh, savage fury. She's a prostitute, what, what else is new? Uh, she, uh, but he gives her these uh, malevolent colors and extremely dark, threatening, uh, dangerous contours all these dark shadows. I mean, he, he took the light and shadow from the Renaissance and he's applying it in such a different... He's applying it now to, to convey uh, danger, to convey horror that these creatures bring. The symbolism, I think we talked about, uh, the, the, the male uh, perception of a female, either virtuous, whether virgin or virtuous, and then the other is... Uh, incarnation of evil and really nothing in between. She's looking at herself in the mirror so we see her from the front and from the side and of course this is this too is an age-old trick to do that and uh, she seems to be to be a, interesting she seems to be wearing some sort of a rose in her hair uh, unless she's wearing two roses because this is not supposed to to be conveyed in the mirror but Van Eyck did that of course Cezanne did that the uh, the following of the eye in a very different uh, sort of way. Uh, and uh, you almost, you don't see this eye. You see the other eye and then it, it spills disaster. It spills sort of the, the perennial horror of male castration. This hatred will ease out. Uh, he'll mellow out, so to speak, a little later. Oh, well, not yet. There's his um, head of a tragic clown and clowns, again, traditionally, uh, were a favorite subject of an artist because, I mean, here is a man whose role in life is to go before, before the public and pretend happiness, pretend happiness, which he may not feel at all, which, in fact, he, he may feel uh, torn by, by devil incarnate inside his soul. His soul could be, but, but that's his job. That's what his living depends on, to go and make people uh, happy, and that's his talent as well. Well, who paints him as he uh, left the stage and came to his room where he changes. He's still in costume, as you see. He hasn't even taken the hat off. And, uh, and, and, and this is the moment after he left the stage, after the curtains close on him, and all the darkness spills out, and all the horror of his soul spills out. And look what Ro does here. He kind of slashes the canvas with this uh, with this distorted dark colors. Slashing he's slashing his own soul. It's almost as if he's it's it's a self portrait of uh, how he felt mm -hmm. even while he was painting this. It reminds me of the scream. Yes. By Munch. It's like the same kind of spilling out of the horror that's uh, and the way uh, you see that one eyeball in the darkness. I know, I know, as he's looking to the side. Oof. And little teeth, I mean, he doesn't have all the teeth. Oh. I, know. I know. He will mellow somewhat. Uh, and, uh, and as I said, he was 
very religious, so uh, a lot of his things will always involve Christianity. So he'll produce 58 uh, plates, uh, which uh, the, the lithographic plates, and this one is titled The Hard Task of Living, which of course still relates to this, and to her for that matter. Mm -hmm. I mean, this theme of the hard task of living will always, uh, will always emerge through his art, two themes. One is the misery theme, and then the other theme is the war. The First World War was horrific, uh, unnecessary, horrific, brutal, and, uh, well, I mean, Matisse wasn't really touched by it, nor was Picasso, obviously, but, uh, but the majority of people were. And, uh, and, of course, the horror of the trenches comes up here. It's originally engraved, you see, in 1918, which is after the First World War, and then uh, exhibited uh, exhibit 18 and 28, and then exhibited first for the first time after the Second um, World War. And uh, in the, the, the uh, in the first, in the misery, it, it focuses on the misery of humanity uh, in general, and certainly as a result of the war. Uh, and and of course, uh, the the hope of uh, identifying oneself with the sufferings of Christ, whereas uh, the war series is uh, harkens back to, uh, to Goya and the horrors of war, the Napoleon, Napoleonic wars in Spain, and there he's, he actually shows the horrors of war, but again, the Christian message is always there. It's crazy how this and Matisse could exist at the same time. I know. I know. It really draws the contrast. His crucifixion uh, that he painted, uh, I, I, I just put the, uh, the very famous crucifixion by, uh, by a late medieval early Renaissance Italian artist uh, by the name of Cimavua, right here, where he is attempting to, uh, uh, to convey not so much pain as sadness and an elegance, uh, and also to show the anatomy and also to show, of course, his own skill with the portrayal of, um, of drapery and then with uh, uh, the mother and St. John on both sides as done uh, symbolically here on the cross and, uh, and who, who of course, I mean everybody knew these artists, everybody, uh, an artist would know of <laughs> Italian Renaissance and if not go to, to Italy himself their by this time, their illustrations, their lithographs, their copies, this, everything. So he gives him, as you see, a bit of the same uh, of the same form, of the same direction, and there is the mother and Saint John on each side. So the the idea is medieval. The idea of a suffering man on a cross, surrounded by his closest and dearest, uh, continues. Throughout throughout time, he uses this 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 uh, this very brutal almost uh, uh, brush stroke. It's almost the brush uh, becomes uh, an instrument of torture, really. In in uh, here, and then he was also a, a stained glass maker. So the contours, of course, he introduces were very familiar to him, and the contours are everywhere. Yeah. So the method of painting corresponds to the feeling of painting in this respect. Uh, this is one of his most famous, uh, very stained glass uh, uh, image of an old king. We don't know whether, I mean, he clearly refers to, to the biblical old king, whether he refer, refers to David, whether he refer, refers to Solomon, or the unfortunate kings after them who could not hold the kingdom together and as a result failed in, uh, in, their, in their task, we don't know. So probably, uh, probably those l later kings, because both David and Solomon were, uh, were rather successful in everything they did and created the United Kingdom. This looks more as the king who had lost his. Rouen, in fact, himself is very much sort of, he belongs, not he was French. Uh, but frankly, if I didn't know and I looked at his art, I would, I would say German Expressionism. Because the Germans, in the history of art, uh, had this predilection 
to convey pain, to show it, to, to make you feel it. Um, pain, again, torture, misery, all of it was there. This is a great example. So this is called the Eisenheim Altarpiece, and it was painted by one Matthias Grunwald uh, in, the, um, in the early 16th century, and this is another crucifixion, a very different crucifixion from either of these. But if anything, this one is much more in a Grunwald tradition. It's a very large piece, as you see. It's it's uh, it's it's a two, uh, it's a it's a diptych. It could actually be folded together. Here's the seam right there, and uh, again, Christ uh, on the cross. He is in fact so heavy, his body, that uh, that the beam you see bent mm -hmm. under his weight, and in fact, very often uh, in crucifixions, uh, uh, a person was, was given a ledge that he could stand on. I mean, still, I mean, obviously, he would still be attached to the cross and, and feel all the misery, but uh, he would stand on the ledge. What he is doing here, look, he does the ledge, but the entire body's weight is in these arms which are stretching out. And the only thing that attaches those legs to the ledge is that enormous nail. And he's covered, the, 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 the body is covered with some skin disease, sort of, sort of like bubonic plague perhaps. Mm -hmm. And in fact, it was painted for the monastery of St. Anthony, who is the saint of the afflicted. And, uh, and uh, it was a hospital monastery. The monks cared for the, uh, uh, cared for the sick. And many of the sick were, in fact, uh, it was skin disease. And so they could look at this uh, crucifixion and feel affiliation. This is part of German art. It's just how it is. Um, John is here, uh, John the Baptist, with the lamb. So we know this is John the Baptist, even if he doesn't wear his skins. And uh, John the Evangelist is holding up Mary, and uh, Virgin Mary. And, and, of course, uh, Mary Magdalene is also there praying uh, and, uh, and obviously horrified by the sight. So, but this is the tradition that goes, goes into medieval painting, in fact, the German medieval painting, and, and then Bosch, of course, uh, and medieval manuscripts, all of that exhibited this tendency for the grizzly. Uh, there's another one, this is by Dürer who was a great uh, German um, Renaissance artist, uh, printer, engraver. The Four Horses of the Apocalypse, because we, uh, we think of what's, uh, of what's the worst. You know, we'll talk about it when we get to Kandinsky. This is, the, uh, this is the time when one millennium ended and the other millennium began. So, and it's often in uh, religious thought, the, the thoughts of uh, uh, of millennium and of paying the price and Christ defeating the devil. So this would be appropriate here. So the far horseman drawing his bow and represents pestilence, which is a white horse. And then the second with a sword, a red, a red horse. This is the four horsemen. The third with the scale of justice is famine, black. And then the fourth with a pitchfork. The most famous one is death and it's pale. I don't know what's the difference between pale and, and white. You don't know what color pale. Right. Pale what? German expressionism. What they were convinced about is that it's what they felt is the truth. The truth of their feeling can be expressed on the canvas. And thus we get the German expressionism. But remember, they are in the tradition of this medieval slash renaissance uh, German expressionism. And whether in England or in France or and now in Germany as well, in Italy, artists uh, sort of organize into societies. And sort of what uh, Van Gogh wanted when he was waiting for Gaga to come to come south, to come to Arles, to, to, to create a society of artists in the south. Uh, so in Germany, there, one of the societies is called Die Brücke, uh, which is a bridge. So they felt very much that this is the bridge into the future, the bridge into perhaps a better world, but it is very much up to them to, to show what, 
uh, what mistakes we have made and uh, what world we are leaving for the better world. You see, as, as you see all these, this, this, I mean, Nold also lived a very long life, look, almost uh, 90. Um, but all these people are, are living through this, the, the millenarian border. So here is his representation of Christ now. And, uh, and, and we have absolutely, here we have absolutely no idea of space. No, Zero. No social distancing. No social distancing. In fact, uh, no even social propriety. I mean, can you imagine a group of people together as they are, literally sitting on top of one another? I mean, what he's doing really is uh, uh, there's a space here for us if you really want to join. There's just one little space for us. All the apostles are around, and uh, it's almost as if uh, he is painting them at the moment. Uh, no, not at the moment of the Last Supper, but at the moment when they all betray him, essentially. It wasn't just Judah who betrayed him. But then, uh, remember, Peter betrayed him three times when, when he was asked. And then all the apostles ran away when, uh, when he was arrested um, by, by the Roman guard in the gardens of, of Gethsemane. Uh, so it's almost as if he's betraying all of them as, as traitors. No one is to be trusted, no one is to be believed. And uh, the only man that looks, I mean, they all uh, look hypocritical is this Judah uh, in black. He's, his whole expression is hypocritical, conveying this, this um, sort of artificial uh, piety, which perhaps he doesn't feel. And only Christ in the middle has sort of a tragic face, but, but the colors are all around him. And, and these colors are pulsating, is giving you a headache. Uh, and, and also, of course, this closeness, uh, everybody around, it's uh, like we're, we're back to the masks. Oh, speaking, we're back to the masks, exactly. The Doubting Thomas, remember James and Sore? The uh, Doubting Thomas, again, leering, this leering, uh, uh, strange figure that does not believe in the message that, of course, must, uh, must be immediately apparent to anyone um, who is devout and uh, just portraying the horror of the surrounding world. And there are the masks, and James and Sword did the same. It's interesting because usually Doubting Thomas has such an interesting role as oh, the yes. one who questions. Exactly, the one who I just mean, doesn't take everything on faith. I mean, in the Bible, when, when he questions whether or not Christ has resurrected uh -huh. and Christ shows him his wound to kind of prove it, it's left open, in the, in the Bible it says he, sh he exposed the wound for Thomas to touch, but they never discuss whether or not Thomas actually touched it. Right. Because Here he doesn't. Well, yeah, because in, in the... in the Here his hands are kind of... Right, clasped and supplication. Clasped together. Because the intention is to show like, what, what, what is doubt? I mean, is it, do you doubt with, when do you believe? Is it enough to see with your eyes? Do you need to touch with your hands? Right. And here you you have a double wound where usually it's just the it's yes just usually he just shows the wound on the side whereas here he shows the um, uh, the wound on the his stigmata the stigmata yes thank you yeah. on his hand as well and this leering face it almost uh, looks as if this uh, this face has now turned into into this he almost and, and these blood red lips mm -hmm. it's almost as if he doesn't just want to touch it, it's almost as he's vampire-like. Oh, yeah, he's got these pointy ears that exactly. they're, they're red, like horns. Yes. It's, yeah. it's a and, very and strange and different because, depiction of... Uh, right, very different because the uh, lips are red and then of course wounds are red. To say nothing of the other disciples, I mean, they just they just look terrifying. Yes. Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. An interesting painting. Yeah. In this respect. I kind of love this. Uh, he is uh, Danish. So lives on the northern sea, and northern seas are treacherous. They could be calm. They, they could, uh, they could be tempestuous very quickly. And the light in the north is very different from the light in the south. It, there's always this combination. It could be warm, but there's always coldness on the side as well. And he kind of portrays it. This is abstract expressionism. I mean, the American Americans uh, uh, post-war abstract expressionism will be doing sort of like this. But I think the colors here, and the fact is I'm from the north, <laughs> and uh, I was brought up on the Baltic Sea, which is a very northern sea, and, and 
I understand because I actually saw this. I, I grew up with these. He got it. He uh, definitely did, he did get it. Uh, he conveys the coldness and yet the hope or warmth and the choppy sea and you kind of, uh, and again, you, you're waiting for it to come down, but then you know it might become tempestuous. Very nice. He also became devout towards the end of his life. And, uh, and uh, he became a very interesting printer. And uh, this is uh, one of his, um, uh, the prophet's face, and uh, solemn, the eyes hollow. Another expressionist is someone delightful, actually. Uh, his name is um, Kirchner, Ernst Kirchner, who, is, uh, who was just a typical bohemian. He lived as a bohemian. He uh, was defined of life and uh, indifferent to his health uh, and, and, of course, uh, demonstrated a very casual, very matter-of-fact attitude to sex. Um, uh, his paintings, in fact, are divided between his studio and the, street of Ber and the streets of Berlin. And the studio, he is there with his friends, whatever, he, his, he had a, a lot of friends. But everybody is there <laughs> very often naked. In, uh, in different poses and doing whatever one does. Uh, uh, so those, uh, and he paid for it dearly because, yeah, he became ill, of course. But then the streets themselves, he was fascinated by the streets of Berlin and kind of the jerkiness of it and the speed of it and the modernity of it. But he again was fascinated with the prostitutes. I mean, it will always be the theme. Uh, and they were called cocottes, and uh, he, he would paint a number of them. In this very Gothic kind of tradition, uh, the Gothic tradition of uh, angular, splintering presentation of broken lines. So his tradition, Germanic tradition, is not classical, is more Gothic tradition, and that's how he paints it, and, and he likes this, this nervous, nervous instability of, uh, of the line. So here, I mean, it almost gives ele a gothic elegance. So here are they're, they're these elegant women, and uh, they're always accompanied by many men who, uh, who desire, of course, to, uh, to accompany them to their abodes, and all of this is surrounded by stone walls. It's, this, it's the forest of stone, and in between this forest uh, walk these uh, sirens who catch men that destroy them. So here's one, there's another. Everything is short, everything is angles, everything everything is uh, and disquiet. They, they do look like sirens because they look like they're on their own island. Like Odysseus I know, is about right? to sail past through this green yeah. water. Exactly. Rather than it being a street. Yeah. Yeah, and very true. Calling to Odysseus too. Very true. Wait, look, you even have a man stepping off of his little oh, safe. His, yes, towards to, them. Towards them. And yeah, and this is all bristling, and this is all, this all looks like green water about to consume you. Interesting painter. And look, there's an army of men. She is, it's, it's, it's almost as if she is at the head of the two lines of soldiers that follow her into battle. It's as if the waters of the Red Sea mm -hmm. open up as she walks, as she walks by. In her this gorgeous, very attractive red coat. Uh, he had been to war. Mm -hmm. And, uh, well, he calls it his um, self-portrait, but uh, you see the hand is missing here, and, and uh, the right hand, in fact. Uh, you know, it's, you know what perhaps it might be? is He's an artist. Uh, I don't know whether he was left-handed or right-handed, but if he, he may be, he may have been uh, right-handed. What he's trying to show us is that it's almost as if, as if his ability to draw has changed so tremendously. This is a self-portrait missing the hand with which he draws. Yeah, and then again, uh, a man comes out of the war, comes out of the trenches, comes out of all the horror of war, and he is put together, his wounds uh, presumably are healed. This wound is not healed, you see. It's, it's, it, that's why I'm saying it, it, might, it must be a commentary on his change in his perspective of art. But then after, what does he think about? He's thinking, of course, about a nude. He's thinking about sex, and this is what it is. The uh, Kita Kolbitz, uh, who was um, a wife of a doctor, and she too, she's, she was kind of another Van Gogh in terms of empathy. Uh, she very much, she, and as you see, 
the First World War, of course, she died at the end of the Second World War. And she saw the wounded and the miserable and, the, uh, and of course, uh, psychologically horribly affected by the war. And uh, at some point she turned to her own idea of a history painting, but the, his the history painting she turned to is an event in Germany that took place in the first half of the 16th century uh, and, and there were peasant revolts and the reason they happened was it was right after the Protestant Reformation at which point Luther appealed to people in general uh, with the message that one has one's own consciousness, one does not need to go to priests, one does not need to bend to them or listen to what they say, one has uh, a direct line to God uh, and can determine one's own fate and, and much of the peasantry in, uh, in Germany uh, uh, at the time just, just felt empowered, felt empowered that they could in fact rise against, um, against those who abuse them, against those for whom they work and against those for whom they slave in fact because, uh, because the peasantry at that time was still attached to the land. Luther changed his mind very quickly and jumped on the side of, uh, of, of the powerful and the wealthy and, and ultimately these, uh, these rebellions were brutally uh, put down. The symbol here is, is called Black Anna who is a symbol of calling to, uh, to action and it's, we see her from the back, we only see those bony arms and it's as if she's opening up the floodgates for all the misery that we had just seen, that we had seen uh, with Ro and Noldi and all these German expressionists, all these, this pent up anger and misery and horror just to go and, uh, and make make oneself heard and, and here is this wave of protest armed with agricultural uh, tools of course as they rush, uh, rush forward and they're men and women together, unstoppable. Uh, and the women, they're not outsiders anymore. They are full, full force participants. She began to produce these extraordinary images of, uh, of loss, loss of a child, loss of a mother. Here is uh, here's one, his death is grabbing the mother who's so young, so full of life, and you can see it. And the little child is, is, is trying to fight against death, and of course the child is um, small and, uh, and, and helpless and, and cannot, cannot bring his mother. And here too, here, just two people who are one and, uh, and one half of this person uh, is dying and, and, and the misery is so profound. Uh, so that's why I said that he, she kind of has uh, almost Van Gogh's uh, empathy, the way she can just convey, uh, convey pathos, a heartbreak. Um, it's crazy. It's here, crazy. look, here's the two people, yeah. No, yeah. I, I, was yes, gonna, I, I was just gonna follow what you were saying and saying it's crazy because you, with the break, we were talking about it earlier in this lecture, with the breakdown of the old rules, these artists went in completely different directions. It's like Matisse who went for conviviality, and then you had these other artists who... And Picasso went for the shock. And, and yeah. so you have these artists like Matisse and Gauguin, and then, and who are just kind of using the the breakdown of rules as a means to to just snatch and grab, and then you have artists like Kulitz and Van Gogh who take this opportunity, who take the freedom they're given with this with this opening up of the rules, to just seek within themselves and right. find this the depth of humanity. Right. And, and that's, that's the best thing about modern art. Right. That's, that's so because it allowed that that kind of. There are very few, really. They're and that's what they fought for. That's what and, the and you always for. Yes, and you always can tell true sincerity. Kandinsky is sort of regarded as a father of abstract painting. You may have heard the name. Uh, he was Russian. He vacillated between Russia and uh, Germany. Ultimately, he, uh, he stayed in Germany uh, and 
that was intelligent of him, of course, uh, considering the, uh, the Soviet Revolution of uh, 1917. He always, always sort of claimed himself to be a spiritual man, and then he was. There was no question about that. He also, as he began to paint, of course, looked at all the developments of the 19th century and uh, for wisdom, not least of it, and uh, also Impressionism, of course, and the, and the freedom of the brush. Um, he was a scribbler as well, loved to write things down, and uh, in one of his treatises, he in fact wrote that painting must uh, watch out for falling into, uh, into pure abstraction trap because then it just becomes essentially decorative and, uh, um, and one doesn't want that. It's interesting that he says that because he was in fact uh, probably one of the very first who in fact did become uh, an abstract painter and showed the way for the uh, later uh, abstract expressionists, uh, American abstract expressionists, um, that, that, uh, that will work after the Second World War. He was uh, part of uh, still another movement, the, the, Blau, uh, the Blauer Reiter, as you see, which is called, the, which is essentially uh, means the Blue Rider, and the uh, name of the uh, group uh, came from this painting. And uh, just as with De Brucke, the Blauer Reiter professed freedom of expression and in, the, in certainly in painterly terms and in the uh, psychological terms. Uh, the one thing about um, uh, Kandinsky that uh, we also kind of need to remember is that um, he was very much a follower of, um, of this <laughs> Madame Blavatsky, who was Russian-Polish, and um, she was extremely uh, popular at the uh, turn of the, of the millennium, really, because we were going into the new millennium. And she was propagating this, this new spiritualism called Theosophy, and as I said, was, uh, was very popular with a number of people. She felt that millennium was the epoch of, uh, of great uh, spirituality, and in fact, uh, art would not really be needed uh, in the new epoch because, uh, uh, I mean, it's sort of the same thing as uh, with the, uh, say, communism that was experimented not very successfully in the Soviet Union and still being, being lived through, in fact, by, by the likes of North Korea and, um, and Cuba, where society, where the theory was that the state will no longer be needed, money will not, no longer be needed, Everybody will sort of live in live in a state of uh, of primordial Arcadia, and of course the primordial Arcadia never happened. And uh, well, she obviously she was not so aggressive, and she she just concerned herself with uh, converting the souls to her uh, to her understanding and paying their dues. Well, Kandinsky was a complete convert. He uh, he very much believed in this sort of thing which ultimately will explain um, uh, his, um, uh, his painting. He also had this, the, the, the incredible memory in the sense that uh, I mean, he was um, uh, nearsighted, so he would see the objects uh, in the distance uh, in blurry patches, and he had an interesting memory which remembered those blurry patches. He, uh, he saw sounds and he, uh, he heard the colors, literally, with his state of mind. And that's what he uh, then um, wanted to, uh, uh, to express. Also, again, not forgetting that he was Russian. So um, he was very, very impressed by the Slavic uh, folk tales and the riders and the castles and the spears and the bridges and the log cabins and the nesting dolls and all of that very, very bright. The, uh, Russian folk art is extremely bright. And uh, so as he began to paint, he was spilling it all 
onto the canvas and even in this blue writer we don't quite know what it is that it, it, I mean I personally can think of uh, of a number of fairy tales where something like this uh, uh, would be appropriate to in the imagination of a person who grew up with with uh, with these things um, as you see well it's ni it's 1908 by this time remember 1905 uh, uh, Matisse spilled his colors in the Salon d'Atome and that made a tremendous impression on everyone and you begin to see these uh, their arbitrary arbitrary colors in in a, in a number of canvases of the contemporaneous uh, artists and of course you see these colors in Kandinsky as well particular I mean this is still uh, a, a realistic painting in the sense that you can recognize objects this this is a piece painting recognizable objects but um, the uh, the fauve colors for someone as nearsighted as Kandinsky who sees these uh, patches of color uh, was uh, was uh, very helpful this is also in the same 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 1908 he is uh, he is in germany and uh, perhaps in the summer in the spring he's seeing all these colors and uh, and painting in very much in the uh, uh, in the folk tradition uh, here's a train this will will look through it soon enough uh, this is the time of, of just tremendous technological development and the trains of course appeared back in the uh, towards the middle of the uh, of the 19th century in England first and then uh, railroads everywhere uh, slashed everywhere through Europe and <laughs> even uh, even in Russia and as backward as Russia was we saw Monet uh, uh, painting them and, and other painters as well and, and here is um, the uh, Kandinsky's take on it. I mean, they were they were just really uh, impressing. All this technology was very much impressing the contemporary imagination. And uh, here he sees it truly as just sort of this black patch of uh, uh, unstoppable uh, turbine of sort. And turbine will be discovered as well. The turbine energy uh, cutting cutting through all the conventional colors, cutting through the villages, cutting through towns, and, uh, and bringing progress with it. And progress, I mean, uh, in the middle of the 19th century, all this technology at first was met with disapproval, and we saw the Impressionists, how, how they sort of ran away uh, to, uh, to the countryside where they wanted to rest from this advance of technology. By, by the end of the century, uh, things kind of changed and uh, it, became, uh, it became part of life and, uh, and, kind of, and, and rather an exciting part of life. Uh, so this, this whole technological progress was seen as uh, advancing society into some unknown lands, lands of uh, development, lens of thinking, lens of uh, self-consciousness. Of course, Freud is, um, is writing uh, at, at the same speed at the moment as this train is moving. Thus, slowly but surely, and of course, with the help of, uh, of Madame Blavatsky and this whole theological, uh, uh, theological influence on him, that we shouldn't forget. We cannot just look at these paintings uh, as they are and try to comprehend them without really understanding what motivated the artist who painted it. And what motivated Kandinsky was a lot of seances uh, with the medias and a lot of seances with Madame Blavatsky and firm belief that uh, something is changing tremendously and her belief that art will not be needed any longer, that art will only exist in a state of subconsciousness and uh, so he writes a lot about spirituality um, so and then he calls these things composition one composition two creation his creation of abstract work followed a long period of development and, uh, and a long period of writing and in that writing of course he gives himself um, the luxury of saying of talking about 
his introspection. I mean, this was the, the, the time of digging. I mean, this is the t of, in, within oneself to see how one reacts to the outside world, to see how one reacts to all these technological development, developments on the one hand, and, uh, and then the power of, uh, of the spiritual. So he called this devotion to uh, inner beauty, fervor of spirit. And spiritual desire he called inner necessity. And that was, well, the, uh, the central aspect of his art. I mean, here you still can sort of recognize things. There's, there, there, there's still riders. There's a man on the horse. These, the, there's something that looks like an old, the, a couple of villagers, uh, an old man with a beard and, uh, and a woman with her babushka. Uh, the, there's a man on a white horse, there's another man on a blue horse, somebody's running, there is a human being here, there's four there, there's still another seemingly emerging from an egg, um, and not quite certain what the, the background is. Everything, of course, because it's completely flattened out. Um, but without, I mean, the cubism will do it, the cubism the Brock and Picasso will be fighting with perspective, but under a completely different set of values than Kandinsky is doing. There will be nothing theosophical about either Picasso uh, or Brock, or there will they'll, they'll be no inner necessity or, or mystical experiences. And here, just, just to show you all the things that were changing the world, and we cannot separate them from uh, the artistic field. 96, radioactivity is discovered. Also in 96, greenhouse effect. 97, an electron. 98, the uh, virus, uh, or what it is, the virus, not just... Uh, the name virus. The name virus. That's uh, very topical to today. Exactly, very topical. Now the 98 model of an atom was created. 1905, theory of special relativity, Albert Einstein, uh, and uh, well, we saw how that was already affecting Cezanne. Uh, 1906, third law of uh, thermodynamics. 1907, uh, chemotherapy. 1909, industrial production of ammonia. 1909, again, the charge on an electron, 1911, uh, the atomic nucleus. I, and I, I mean, this is just tremendous. It seems somebody said that um, in the 30 years, say, between uh, whatever, 18, uh, 1890 and, uh, or even earlier, and the early uh, the 20th century, uh, it just seemed that there were greater changes then, if we dip into the age of antiquity, uh, then then would happen over millennia. But at least we are kind of used to the idea of technological progress. They weren't, and uh, and all these developments seemed uh, seems just seem just astonishing. So when you see something like this composition um, seven, which was the most complex piece he ever painted, as he said, here I actually don't see any virtual reality. And uh, what he paints, essentially, is what he sees inside of him under the influence of all those developments. I mean, the atom is being split. It's no longer the finite, the finite part of the universe. Radioactivity, the telegraph, I mean, or, uh, and how does an artist react to all that? In fact, the Cubists will probably be the most successful in, uh, in trying to adapt to the new mode, because I mean, short of just um, painting a machine, uh, which, which Leger will do in fact, that he was the most successful at just painting the, uh, the components of machines. Uh, but short of that, how do you express yourself otherwise? So that was Kandinsky's way, assisted by theosophy.